We've been um, really diving into the nitty gritty of who we are as a church, who we are as the, as the bridge, who, you know, what our mission is, what do we value? And, uh, you know, we touch on this periodically, but I, I really felt like, again, moving into this year that we, we really needed to refresh. And there's a whole lot of planning that goes into everything that we do, which, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't that way. And I'm not saying that that was a, a bad thing. I loved the freedom uh, that we operated, and I think it was necessary for that season. Uh, but one of my fav all-time favorite quotes from staff meetings that we, ho we hold uh, was Jeremy years ago when he said, I, I feel like that the traction for freedom is greater when the level of planning is higher. And, you know, for a prophetic church, like that kind of wigs you out because as prophetic people, like we didn't really want to plan anything because God would just be the great orchestrator and he is. But the reality is that he will not direct steps if we have not made a plan. Scripture says a man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. There is always planning involved. As a matter of fact, you know, God at the beginning made a plan. He said, the Lord said to my Lord, let's make, let us make man in our own image. There was a plan in place before creation began. You know, God didn't just roll the dice and say, oh, let's just see what happens. He created a picture in his mind. He created a picture in his heart. And then he understood that because he was all in all, he had to contract within himself a space that was dark and formless and void so that he could speak into that space and create something new. There's a principle in that uh, for all of us to learn that sometimes when our life seems so full, we're so busy, we're so spent, we're so stretched, we have to find a space, we have to create a space that might seem chaotic in a moment, that we have to create a space within our lives that might seem dark and formless and void, but that's the very space that we will create that in which God will breathe and birth something new. Uh, scripture actually calls that Sabbath. And there are some of the greatest breakers of Sabbath I know are leaders in the church. They just don't know how to stop. I don't really have that problem. I'm pretty good at stopping a lot of times. Sometimes my brain doesn't stop, even when my body stops. But that's what's enabled me over the years to go at the pace that, it, that I went at, even though I still burned out. That's another story. That's another, that's another story for today. But the, the stopping and the guarding of time in which you create space in your life that God can breathe into is what will sustain you in your next season, but not even your next season, let's just talk about your next week. But all of that is part of the plan. And if you don't co-labor with God in your planning, when you take that step, you won't have the rudder in your life in which he can actually direct your steps. And sometimes, you know, when we're, when we're rallying around the prophetic pole in the kingdom, we're just expecting God to direct our steps without the planning. You know, we received a prophetic word, and now we're waiting for destiny, you know, destiny to happen, to magically happen. And uh, you know, I've been kind of back reading some Miles Monroe and listening to Miles Monroe, and I kind of cycled through. When I was doing my master's and my doctorate, there was uh, quite a bit of Miles Monroe material that we went through just for leadership. But he said something, I was going to say recently, it was probably 20, 30 years ago because he was talking about cassette tapes. And they were just transitioning into CDs and everybody clapped, you know, it was like, so it's just, uh, that let me know how long ago that message was. But, but he said, uh, what did he say? He said something like, oh, he said that faith, uh, planning is the highest level of faith. Yeah. And that might seem counterintuitive, but what is faith? Faith calls something that is not as though it is, but you can't call something that is not as though it is unless you begin to start formulating a plan in which to call something that is not as though it is. Does that make sense? I kind of speaking in a circle there. Because I, I, that gave me a little bit of a twinge because, you know, prophetic is, is very much a part of my being. And I kind of denied that for a few years because I didn't want to identify as a prophet because y'all are weird. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little bit weird. So I kind of, I'm okay with that. I mean, it's sort of accurate, but, you know, when I lead worship, I get weirder typically. Um, but anyway, that's some other day. So, 
it, it kind of, I had to sit there and process that. Is that actually true? And that's when I began to think through scripture about how God, even God himself made plans. He is the prototype for how we are to function on earth. You know, every time God speaks, every time God moves, every time God interacts with humanity, I take note because God doesn't do anything just for the sake of doing it. Everything he does, he does as a good father because he's teaching his children how to walk. And so even at the beginning, when, he, when, when scripture talks about him saying, having this conversation within himself in the Godhead, the Lord said unto my Lord, let us make man in his own image. He is establishing what it looks like to dream, to plan, to implement, to create, to establish. And that's why scripture says, where there is no vision, people perish. I mean, I, I think a more accurate translation is people cast off restraint. Why do they cast off restraint? And maybe that's, they cast off restraint because there, there are no banks to the river. Vision puts banks and structure to the river so that the river has a momentum and a flow. If you don't have banks to the river, you could start pumping as many cubic feet of water down that passageway, and it's still not going to have momentum. It's just going to turn into a marsh because there's no motion to the water. And so we don't need to fear or be, have any sort of trepidation about structure. You know, back in the 90s and, you know, it was in my 20s and revival was happening and then we kind of came into this, this refreshed prophetic movement that was growing, uh, you know, a side of it. Even, you know, for me even, I, I didn't want structure. I didn't want planning. I didn't want anything to, you know, I just wanted to be free in the spirit. But what I found over time was that in this idea of freedom that I had, it was not creating a soil condition where growth could happen. So we're, we want to disciple people from babies into oaks of righteousness. And that takes time. When you go white water rafting, you want to be in a river that has banks. Because if you're on a river that doesn't have banks, there's not going to be any white water. You might get a little frothy stuff right at the beginning. But, you know, 10 feet down the waterway, it's just going to spread out. I used to love, I mean, I loved white water rafting. I loved, you know, anything that was, I don't know. Yeah, it was sort of thrilling. It was, it was what, I remember going on one trip and uh, there were some guys from the, the worship team that I was on and like the very first rapid, the guy in the front, in the boat in front of me, he, he bailed, got tumbled up on some rocks and he was done. That was it. And that gets my competitive juices flowing. I was like, okay, I'm in now. Like, let's go. Like, you know, you can, you can potentially bleed. All right. Let's go. I'm going to do this thing. And we had a great time. It was good. Now, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I'd do it now. I mean, I could, but I need to maybe get in shape a little bit. I was talking about cardio with someone you know, just this morning, and I don't know how cardio I am. I need to get cardioed back up. But, you know, I had surgery, you know, in August, and then, you know, you know the Peloton looks good when you look at it but it doesn't do anything unless you get on it and move. So here we have this idea, we have this mission to have an impact on our region. But the impact doesn't happen with a charismatic magic trick. As a matter of fact, th this idea that we have a revival isn't just about everybody coming to our great meetings. It's the people who are in our great meetings going out and exporting what they receive corporately in the presence of God. So what does that look like? You know, our mission statement is this, encounter. It starts with encounter. If we don't have an encounter with God, we don't have anything to export other than a good idea. Two people could say the exact same thing from Scripture, but one has the anointing on it and one doesn't. Why? Because the one with the anointing actually had an encounter with the living God. Right. And they're living out that encounter. Our mission is to demonstrate the love of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and to leave the imprint of the Father's heart on everyone we meet until people, communities, cities, regions, and nations enjoy and reflect the fruit of the Spirit beginning with love, joy, 
and peace. Everybody can be a part of that. Even during worship, you know, I was imagining what it would look like if every time I went out to run an errand, which isn't super often, to be clear. But every time I went out to run an errand, if I would just stop and ask the Lord to give me a picture of the person that he wanted to brand today. Because I have had an encounter with the living God. Not just one encounter, but a series of encounters. I have been baptized, fully saturated in the, the, the oil and the fire of the Holy Spirit. And for me, the initial marker of that was boldness. It wasn't some weird manifestation. It, what, even for me, at, at age 11, I didn't speak in tongues right away because my, my brain was too... I, I just, any, anytime I started to speak in tongues, I would start analyzing the language. Now, what am I speaking? What language am I speaking? And then I would stop. And I was like, well, is that real? Is that authentic? I don't really know. But I was bold. I went around as an 11-year-old in my neighborhood preaching the gospel. Not always in the best way. I'm supposed to stay on point, Greta. I, you know, we're really working on that. But, man, I, I had some weird ways of spreading the gospel. All right, I, I have to. I have to amuse myself. So when I was, <laughs> when I was in third grade, remember, you know, I was in third grade, remember the, who was alive when we had that gypsy moth caterpillar infestation? Oh, yeah. oh now we're all excited. <laughs> oh, yeah. You could hear the gypsy moths eating the trees. We'd come down the driveway on my huffy, my bike, and the, the garage door was just covered in gypsy moth caterpillars. My third grade teacher would call me and Tommy Callahan if one got in to go kill it. And they were always every day. So, and the way that we would kill it was to separate its head from the body because that's what little boys do sometimes. And it doesn't mean they're all going to be serial killers. I'm just, I'm just me. So... So I was 11, and remembering that was because that was like three years after that happened. And I was in the neighborhood, and my, my best friend's you know, little sister was riding out the bike, and I was riding her bike around, and I was like, hey, I'm going to share the gospel. And I took a caterpillar, and I took the head off. <laughs> and I said, if you die today, would you be in heaven? And she was like, I don't want to be in heaven. I want to be with my mommy. And she rode home crying. Upon which, forthwith, my mom got a call. <laughs> I got home, and she was like, you know, maybe, maybe you should tailor your message just a little bit. <laughs> See, even scripture says that his kindness leads us to repentance. See, God leads with his goodness. You know, he doesn't lead with a sandwich board saying that the end is near. That idea is really for the believer. But the thing is, we've been in the final hour for 2,000 years. I, I always get a chuckle when some world event happens and someone inevitably will say, oh, we're really in the end times now. I was like, yeah, well, Jesus actually said we're in the end times. It's just been a long couple millennia of end timing. The idea is that we live each day to the fullest. We live our purpose out each day to the fullest, taking every opportunity to do good to all, especially to the household of faith. That's actually in the Bible. Because there's this expectation that at any moment, anything could happen because that's the beauty of being enraptured in the mystery of who God is. And so once we have that encounter, we all have the, the capacity to extend that brand, that fiery brand of the Father's heart and leave an imprint on someone's life. It doesn't mean necessarily that we're gonna close the deal, that we have to share the four spiritual laws or a chick track or, or whatever. It, it, but what it will do is it will bring people into an encounter with something that is greater than anything that they had ever experienced before. And his name is Jesus, Yeshua, the anointed one. And it's that Jesus who dwells in you that is the hope of the revelation of the glory of God. God on earth. And if we are not releasing him, we're not extending him outside of our lives, even in inconvenient times. And when I say stuff like that, it begins to convict me because you guys know how I like to be a master of my own time, especially if I am out running an errand. 
But there was a, a song back in, it might have been in the 90s or the 80s, but, that said, you're the only Jesus that will, some will ever see. Yes. How true is that? And so when we begin to think in terms of our life being a fiery brand that can be extended, leaving an imprint of his name, of his fame, of his love, of his goodness on someone's heart, being poised and ready to answer questions, should they arise? Be poised and ready to pray for someone, should they be ready? We create a, a system now, a structure through which we can make decisions upon how we operate within this mission that we have. And every time we walk into this building, we see our value system. And it's a system of ranked values. And so love is at the top, it's the su supreme value. We love family, and I love your nuclear family, but I'm really talking about kingdom family because the, the effectiveness of your nuclear family is, is only in as much as you teach your children how to integrate with kingdom family because that's scripture. I know it's not super popular right now to talk, talk that way, but that is scripture. And then the greater community. We love the greater community. And this is the tension you find in the, the fivefold. For example, you know, evangelists always want to be on the outside of the, the walls, whereas pastors always want to be on the inside of the walls. Prophets usually just want to be by themselves and, you know, calling heaven down and, you know, getting the next revelation. Teachers want to make sure that everything is doctrinally correct and, you know, we're doing all of the right things. And then, you know, apostles sort of sit in the middle of all that and try to hold the tension together so that as revelation comes, as the mission begins to be walked out, we're putting teeth on what the Lord is speaking so that it moves us forward with kingdom momentum. But it's all valuable. So we love the greater community, but we don't love the greater community in such a way that it violates our love for kingdom family. That's what Paul's teaching to the church in Galatia when he says, do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. So that gives us the scriptural metric through which we can make decisions. And then, of course, we have excellence. We love excellence. But I've seen ministries and I've seen times and places and spaces, even in churches, where excellence becomes this supreme value and we end up violating love. We end up violating, violating kingdom family in the name of excellence when really what we're talking about is excellence is looking at you as an individual and saying, are you excelling? Are are you growing day after day, year after year? Are you walking this walk with greater effectiveness than you did a year ago? Are you doing your job in a better way than you did a year ago? Are you progressing? Are you excelling? It's not this idea of excellence where every little thing has to meet some standard so that we look cool to the world. I want to be accurate I, I want to say this, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm, I'm being actor, accurate, but I'm not super concerned about looking cool to the world. I'm not super concerned about looking cool-ish. You know, I mean, I get my hair cut, and I do things, and, you know, I dress, and my wife dresses me. If it's black and it's gray, it's usually me. If it's got color, it's her. I'm good with black, white, and grays. After that, my, my whole color coordination thing, I, I, you know, I get angsty. It's a source of anxiety. I know, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and petition, bring a request to God. God, do these clothes match? I don't know. <laughs> Debbie says they do. Turning your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 54. And Holy Spirit, as we navigate your word, we step through the beginnings of this year, 2023, God. Lord, I ask for a sharpening, a, a sharpening in our focus and our resolve to see your kingdom come fully manifest on earth as it is in heaven, even through our individual lives, so that as we come together corporately, we have a kingdom to celebrate. Would you open our hearts and our minds to receive what it is that you're pouring out? upon your church and upon the earth 
today. Catch us up to what you're doing because revival is on the land today. Hallelujah. Isaiah 54, 14, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version here. It says this. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. Last, last week we talked a little bit about fretting. Do not fret. Here we're talking about fear. They're very closely related. But there's... Instruction all across scripture that says do not fear. One of the primary places where we see people in utter fear is when they have an encounter with God. See, when we have an encounter with God, like, you know, and I'm talking about like a manifest presence, like just ready to rock you encounter with God, one of two things typically happens. You either fall on your face as though dead or you stand up in honor of the king. And a lot of times when you fall on your face before God as though dead, he tells you stand up. There aren't these nice cushy chairs in heaven. I mean, there might be. I don't know. I can't really, I can't confirm or deny that, you know, these nice cushy chairs in heaven. But we're very much involved in our comfort, in our convenience. We live in an on-demand society. And every, every attribute of society, we have to measure it against kingdom. And sometimes in our quest to be quote unquote relevant, we begin to lower the standards of the kingdom so that it looks like the world instead of it establishing a standard that is kingdom that gives the world a target to shoot for. And so this, this verse, this one verse, in righteousness you shall be established. We are righteous for one reason and one reason only, not because we entered a, a behavioral modification program, not because, you know, we're perfect little angels when we drive in rush hour traffic and we hold our tongues when unjust things happen. Like someone cuts you off or another person runs a red light on Route 9, which happens every single day. Just telling you, on Route 9, when the light turns green, it does not mean go. It means look both ways. And then you go. Teaching my son how to drive. I got to teach him, you know, there's the rules of the road and then there's the rules of the road. There's the law and then there's the culture. You've got to understand both to ensure that you get from point A to point B safely. And so scripture says that we are righteous by faith alone. If it was anything that we could do to be righteous, then we could boast of ourselves. Then we're talking about religion. Then we're talking about going through a system of steps that gets us to this, this level of ascension that God has desired for us to be, when really the, the, the reality is when we access him by faith, it is accounted to us as righteousness. This is why some of the most effective evangelists I've ever met are newborn Christians, because they haven't been messed up by systems of logic that are based upon lies that we believe to be true. And so they're not afraid. They're just stepping out. They're, they're just leaving that fiery brand everywhere that they go. I love that stuff. Is everything doctrinally or theologically correct? I don't know. But I, but I know that some of these people that, that have become newborn believers, when they step out and they begin to speak, people... They say yes to it because it's not an idea that they're coming into agreement with. It's that they've experienced the imprint of the Father's heart upon their lives. Yes. We have to have that encounter to have something to export. Yes. So we will be established. We'll be far from oppression. Why? For you shall not fear and far from terror, for it shall not come near you. You can be in an environment that is oppressive, but not be oppressed. I've seen it. I've been in nations where systematic oppression is a thing against the church, but I've looked upon a people that even though they are in a governmental environment that would systematically oppress them, they are not oppressed. Oppressed. 
Why? Because fear has not come near them. You could be face to face and eye to eye with an oppressor, but not come under their oppression. Because you recognize that you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You recognize that he already has the victory. And although my body might be afflicted, my spirit is shining white with the fire and the passion of the living God. I met a man who spent 25 years of his adult life in prison for his faith. He was he literally bore the, the, the marks of his faith on his body from beatings, and he was one of the most joyful men I've ever met. And he had to sit under my teaching. And I'm like, what am I, what am I gonna say to this guy? He leads a network of 2.5 million oppressed Christians who are burning with fire and glory for the living God. And it's amazing the reports that I'm hearing. As oppression goes up, revival goes out. There's just something about that. You know, some people are, are, are so concerned about America and the direction. I get that we, we need to pray for our nation. But I'm not super concerned about the increased oppression against this Judeo-Christian ethic. Because I recognize that as the enemy be, tr attempts to raise a standard, the kingdom raises a standard against him. And guess who always wins? Yes, Jesus. All we got to do is re remind the enemy of the cross. That's what I love about communion. Every time we, we have communion, I have this picture of him setting that table in the presence of the enemy. And we get to stride up to that table with such confidence in faith and understand that that scepter of justice has been extended to us. And even as the enemy brings accusation against us, and some of the things he says are true because he's watching. But there is a truth that is greater than the truth of the, uh, of the accusation. It's Jesus saying, oh, but this one is righteous by faith. This one is justified by my blood. So there is no trial. There is no conviction. There, I am judge. I am jury. Your accusation is null and void. And that's what the table of the Lord represents to me when we receive communion. I see, I picture the scepter and I picture the sword just uh, striking at the heart to thwart the plans of the enemy what the enemy meant for evil, God will turn to good. And yes. righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. The last time I, I spoke out of this scripture was January of 2020. We all thought, we knew what was coming. And I, you know, I, I love all the kind of tongue in cheek, but you know, every December there's a whole bunch of prophetic words that come out for the next year. And so you know, December 19, of, of 2019, all the words started coming about 2020 and we're gonna have 2020 vision. Now, nobody had 2020 vision. <laughs> I remember the, when the lockdown happened, like we thought, oh, it's gonna be like four to six weeks. And I was so angry about it. And four to six months go by. In hindsight, I have 2020. And I realize how powerful just this one verse was for me and was for his people. That in righteousness, we were established. And we are far from oppression, for we will not fear. We'll be far from terror, for it will not come near you. You might be in a circumstance, but it doesn't mean that we have to allow terror to come near. Yes. See, fear is the thing that gives power to the oppressor. And oppression only has power when we have misplaced focus. You can be in an environment of oppression, but that oppressor does not have power unless you fear. And when we give power to the oppressor, it misplaces our focus. And when oppression has power, it dismantles identity. There's a lot of teaching in the land right now on identity. And I think, I think it's good-ish. 
Because our, our identity gets misplaced when we fear another thing. That's the whole idea of oppression. Even governmental oppression on the earth, it's to suppress the identity of people so that they serve the needs of the government or the dictator or the oppressor. That there's this identity of the one that supersedes the identities of the whole. And the, the identities of the individuals that make up the whole must die in order to support the vision of the one or the identity of the one. So the goal of the oppressor is to strip you of what makes you, you, in order to fulfill their purpose and keep you from fulfilling yours. And God has purposed to make you who you are in order for you to fulfill your purpose so that he gets glory. I, I'm not overly focused on individual identity. That's sort of a, a Western American churchianity idea within the church, but I'm okay with it because we all have this, this call. We all have this purpose that is somewhat individual in nature because every joint supplies, but the purpose is only effective to the point where you are gathered and joined and aligned with kingdom family. And that's this idea that we see throughout scripture, this idea of our individuality, yes, but in it, that it finds its fullness in the, the connectiveness of the plurality. And so you see, even in, in the original language in the text, the, these ideas where a multitude of people are described by a singular noun. But we don't translate it that way because we, we struggle to embrace that mystery. So, so we have the, these passages of Scripture where, you know, the Scripture describes Israel being a, a number of souls, except that the word is soul. That there is this plurality of people that operate as one. We see that in Genesis 3.8 on the back half of the verse where it says the, the man and his woman hid themselves among the tree in the garden. But it's, that's how we translate it. But the actual word says... The man and his woman hid self, plural, but the operation of hiding was singular because everything they did, they did in unity because that's all they had ever seen God do. God walked himself to the spirit of the day and the garden because he was teaching his kids how to walk as one, as he walks as one. In, in, in John chapter 17, Jesus begins to pray about that. Father, I pray that they would be one as you and I are one. There's this idea of oneness in him operating in all of our expressions, in all of our diversity, in all of our callings, in all of our destiny destinies, but they become effective to the point where we walk as a unified front before God. Does that make sense? So God has this idea. He has this purpose for you, but his purpose for you is always going to lead you to be connected to other people. We could spend a hundred hours in the prayer room, or we could spend a hundred hours in prayer a week, but when we are in the Father's heart, when we look around, if we don't see others there, then I have to question where you are. Because he's always about family. He's always about expanding his kingdom. He's always about adding two numbers daily. That's the goal. But sometimes we get stuck. Sometimes we come under oppression. And there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No one's here, you know, swinging a stick and whacking you with it. A lot of times when I start working with people or I start mentoring people, the first thing I ask them to do is read Romans 1 through 8 every day. And in my experience over the last 15 years or so, it typically takes about, 12 to 18 months before you really get it. Because the orphan mentality is so strong. 
And so what happens, especially for people who have you know, maybe grown up in certain sectors of, of faith or certain sectors of religiosity, is they start reading you know, Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and they start feeling condemned because Paul's coming in hard. When he starts going after the, the church in Rome, he leads, he's coming in pretty hard, but you can't stop there. You've got to get to Romans 8.1 where it says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Spirit will bring a conviction to your heart that will cause you to turn your face fully back to him, but it is not condemnation. There's no need for self-flagellation. You don't have to help Jesus on the cross. He had his hands pierced, his feet pierced. He had a spear in his side. He had a crown of thorns thrust down upon his head in mockery. He was broken and he bled for you. You don't have to help him with that punishment. He bore it for you so that you could walk in freedom and, and, and understand what it means that his mercies are new every morning and his grace actually is sufficient for you because when he said it is finished, he really meant it. And so you're free by the blood of the lamb. You don't have to help. And, you know, I grew up trying to self-flagellate. Like, if you don't know what that means, it's a kind of this old process where, you know, the monks or priests would walk around, they beat themselves. And there are other religious, uh, other uh, world religions that still do this to this day. To the point of bleeding. But it's a mockery of the cross. There is absolutely no requirement. But for some reason in my mind, even, even as a teenager, because I would have encounters with the Lord and then I would sort of go back into rebellion. I'd have encounters with the Lord and I'd go back into rebellion. And maybe that week, you know, I said some bad words to somebody. Or I got in a fight. I was smoking cigarettes. I was doing whatever I was doing. And now I'm at church and we're in worship and I'm feeling the goodness of God, but I wouldn't let myself step into the goodness of God because I didn't feel like I, I was worthy, I, that I deserved it. But in Romans 8, 15, when he says, I, I've given you the spirit of adoption, what he's saying is, I have taken you out of your old system of family, and I have placed you now into a household of royalty under the, the, the love of a good, good father. And so now, what you think you don't deserve, you actually have access to every given moment of the day by faith because you bear my name. Not because of anything that you did, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. And so you might have had a bad night, a bad week, or a bad morning. You fought with your spouse on the way to church. Your kids didn't get ready on time, and everybody's stressed out. And now you're just in your worship. You're kind of, oh, I don't want to do this. Yeah, but you can walk in and experience the fullness of the good of goodness of God washing over you and transforming you from one level of glory to another level of glory, even in that moment, even more so in that moment, because number one, one, there's no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. And number two, he has given you the spirit of adoption that has fully transported you from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. And so that old thing, that old construct is, is null and void. It is irrelevant to who you are in Christ Jesus today. But when we are in those moments and we all get in these moments where we come under oppression and terror has come near us or we've chosen to, to walk in fear. And you know, sometimes people will say, well, I didn't choose fear. At some point we did. At some point we did. Because courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the thing that causes you to be diligent, to be steadfast, even when it attempts to come near you. And the word says, if you re resist the devil, he will flee from you. We have so much authority over our own sphere, we don't even know. If we just began, you know, sometimes the church is so concerned about walking in our authority out there, but we haven't even taken authority of what's here. What does it look like to stretch out your hand and say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Fear will not come near me. Terror will not come near me. And as I move, the kingdom is. As I walk, heaven is there. And so when I step into a space that is dark, the darkness doesn't touch me. The light invades the darkness. That's how it works. 
But sometimes we need a little thing called breakthrough. And my friend Tony came out in California. He kind of chuckles at me sometimes because sometimes I make fun of breakthrough. It's probably not godly. Nevertheless, here am I. God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. But here's the reason. Sometimes we get addicted to breakthrough. We get an idea, we, we get addicted to this idea of breakthrough. There was a young guy that used to attend here and he just had all kinds of, uh, you know, issues in his life and, you know, he was unemployed or struggling. It was just always a struggle, always a struggle. And every week he would, you know, maybe give a little bit of an offering. He would write on the, on the offering envelope his prayer request and it was always breakthrough. And we would pray breakthrough over him, you know, week after week after week after week. And then suddenly this breakthrough came. And he got, you know, he, he established his own business and he started to become successful and then he left the church. Because sometimes we're worshiping the idea of breakthrough instead of the one who is the breaker that goes before us. Breakthrough establishes you. When we're talking about this Isaiah 54, in righteousness you shall be established, this righteousness came because the breaker went before us. Jesus on the cross was the breakthrough that established us in righteousness. This breakthrough will establish you, but discipline will cause you to endure. Discipline, let me put it this way, discipline empowers you to endure. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, sound mind. The New American Standard translates it love, power, and discipline. The New American, uh, I mean, the, the New International Version in the New Testament translates a phrase in many places as make every effort. The New American Standard, the, uh, the, American, the Old American Standard Version, Darby, other translations will translate it as with all diligence or something similar. Without diligence, there is no destiny. Without discipline, there is no destiny. You just sit in the midst of your circumstance hoping for your ship to come in. And you might have had breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough, but without follow through, without walking out that breakthrough with discipline, enduring difficulty so that you persevere. And because you persevere, now you have proven character. And now God sees upon you a foundation upon which he can place your destiny upon your shoulders so that you can walk it out effectively without being crushed by it. Now we have sons and daughters that are striking the ground with the sound in New England. And we look to our left, we look to our right, and we, we don't know where it came from, but we understand that revival is here. Yes. How do you take advantage of breakthrough? Because you know, I, I do, I make fun of it, but I like it. Because I like anything that breaks. I always kind of wanted to be the Gallagher of preachers. I, you know, I, I don't know if you guys remember, I don't even know if he's still out doing his thing. He was this comedian and he would like smash things and melons and people in the front, like three rows had to wear these rain jackets or whatever they had to do. Like I, I always like, you know, wanted to speak on breakthrough and get like some cinder block and a giant hammer and just start hammering away at that in front of people. Our insurance company disagrees, but I just think it would be a great idea. But I understand that when breakthrough comes, it provides an opportunity. It is not the opportunity. It provides the opportunity. So how do you take advantage of it when it does come? Number one, you've got to exercise faith. Trust that faith is your righteousness. And because you have righteousness that came by faith, you have access to the throne of grace. The reason why we don't leave the imprint of the Father's heart on everyone that we come in contact with is because we don't feel like we're effective. We don't feel like that, that his power is greater than my personality type. I find it interesting that there's so much focus on understanding our personality types and this and that. And I, I get it. It's good. I'm sure there's some goodness to it. But the reality for me is it doesn't change my mission. I could sit here and tell you about how introverted I am, but it doesn't change my mission. It doesn't change the fact that when I am at Walmart, I'm still called to leave 
the imprint of the Father's heart on everyone that we come in contact with. Because God will call you to something that you might not naturally have the propensity to walk out because his power is perfected in your weakness, not necessarily in your strength. Faith is a guideline that leads toward destiny. But again, destiny without diligence will always leave you in a state of hope deferred, which will actually make your heart sick. There is no destiny without diligence. And diligence and discipline will cause you to exercise the faith that you've already been given. How do you take advantage of breakthrough? Number two, do not fear. I, some, it's, it's easy to say. Sometimes it's hard to do. If a bunch of bees fly in my office and you tell me, do not fear. As a matter of fact, my wife does say that when I'm sitting outside. This past summer, I was sitting outside. I love my back deck. I'm drinking coffee. I got my iPad. I'm playing a game or I'm doing whatever I'm doing. And then this buzz comes by my ear. I don't even know what it was. I threw my iPad. I did. It was just a reaction. I threw my iPad. I saved most of my coffee. You could, see, you could see the hierarchy of possessions the way I view value in that moment. The coffee was in my hands there, but the, the iPad went flying. Did it break? No, it's an iPad. They're, they're sturdy. It's an Apple product. That's those other Android devices. I had a reaction of fear. So you could, in a sense, say that I, I, I didn't choose to fear. I just was fearful. No. But still, you choose to fear. You can choose to be courageous in an adverse circumstance. Let his love lead you away from, the, the, from negative history and future expectations. Let me rephrase that because I missed a word. Let his love lead you away from negative history but toward future expectations. That's an important word. <laughs> we'll edit that in the video. Let his love lead you away from negative history, but toward future expectations. When you, this is the beauty of coming into Christ. Your history and all of its difficulty and the things that would hold you back become irrelevant. And now all of the things in your history that you used to view as negative, he turns as tools to be used for his kingdom in the positive. How many people have, you know, suffered through addictions and they've, they've suffered through, uh, you know, recovery. And now they become the agent to help pull other people out of the muck and mire of their lives. The history was negative, but what the enemy meant for evil, God turned for good. And now the freedom you received in him, you get to extend to others. That's how that works. How do you take advantage of breakthrough? Number three, feed on his presence. That's what we do when we gather together. And number four, listen to his voice and his word. And flip over to Isaiah 55. 55, one through four. This is out of the New American Standard now. Feed on his presence. Listen to his voice and his word. 55, one, it begins with this. Ho! Whenever you hear somebody say, do that in church, now you know where it came from. Exactly. I was on a phone call this week and she had a little manifestation in the office and the person on the phone was like, what was that? I was like, it's just, it's just Greta. Yeah, she was watching James call. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. 
Listen, that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Feed on his presence, Isaiah 51 and 2. Listen to his voice and his word, Isaiah 53. And then out of that Isaiah 54 passage, we exercise faith. We do not fear. You can be in the the valley of the shadow of death, but you don't have to fear any evil because God is with you. We will always be in adverse circumstances. We will always go through seasons of ease and of glory and seasons of suffering. I'm all in on the blessing of God, but I also recognize that we are called to step into the sufferings of Christ as well. And I can live in the tension of both. Because there's such beauty in his presence. There's such glory and breakthrough. But the glory revealed And the purpose of God for you and for me is defined in how we follow through. I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't just stop on the cross, that he was placed in a tomb for three days. And on the third day, a stone was rolled away. The spirit of the living God breathed his breath back into Jesus' mortal body. And Jesus emerged as a victorious king. And he walked this earth for another 40 days. Then he ascended to the right hand of the Father, fully glorified. There was the breakthrough of the cross, but even Jesus is still seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father so that he could gather for himself a people that would be called by his name. Even Jesus followed through and continues to follow through on the breakthrough that was established when he said, it is finished. When he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. He never stopped being God. He never stopped being sovereign. He never stopped being this victorious king, this glorious, undomesticated lion of the tribe of Judah, even in the face of oppression, even in the face of what seemed to be the the most difficult circumstance that a man could endure, rejection and unjust condemnation, he was still God. Fear did not come near him. Terror did not touch him. Even, I I just have this picture in my mind that even as the spirit of, of death began to approach him on the cross, he said, back up. I'm not done yet. Know your place. You are created. I am uncreated. You are a servant. I am the king. And I've got a couple more things to say yet. God, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh, and now I can say, oh, it is finished. And now, whoa, wait one more second. I'm not even going to address you. I'm going to speak to my Father in heaven. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. Now you may come and serve the purposes of the king. He is still that king today, enthroned in majesty and glory and light. To leave an imprint, to leave an impact, you first must be impacted. That's why we do what we do here. To gather together in an environment where God is. To establish a sound upon which he can rest. The sound of praise which he can dwell upon, be enthroned upon, that he can inhabit. So that as people come, they are heart to heart and face to face with the living God. Maybe for the first time, you can understand what it means that his mercies are new every morning, that his grace really is sufficient for you, and that his love for you endures forever. And it's all available to you if you come. Breakthrough is available if you come, but man, when that breakthrough comes, 
got to walk it out day after day night after night understanding that the breaker has gone before you so in just a moment we're going to open up the aisles for our bridge family we do want to take this moment this time to receive your tithes and offerings sometimes I forget to do this Believe it or not, finances are not first and foremost on my mind. But it is an integral part of how we serve God and how we serve our families, how we steward the generations that follow. And so if you're making out checks, you can make them out to the bridge. Or you can text one word, Bridge Metro West, to the number 94,000. Same thing for our online family. And we'll send you a list of options. You can just select give and you can give responsibly by credit card or debit card securely. You can give on our website, bridgemetrowest.com. You can download our app from your favorite app store and you can give there as well. There's a variety of ways and they're all secure. I used to be afraid to talk about finances. I'm not anymore. Why? Because... I've submitted my finances to God. I can't be offended in something that I've submitted to Him. And I so understand how much He wants to bless you because it's part of the purposes of the Church of America is to supply the needs of the kingdom around the world. There's purpose in shalom. It's not something for us to harbor. It's not this blessing from God that he wants us to harbor. It's something that we receive so that we can impart. To be an impact, we have to be impacted. It's the same principle. And we've seen God do unbelievable things, jobs that people don't even apply for that come to them, promotions that they're not even looking for. You know, so I remember one lady applying to be a teller at a bank and she left with a bank manager position. Time after time after time. Even my sister's working a job that she didn't apply for. They called her four times before she said yes. I don't have a ministry resume. I can't remember the last time I did a resume. I didn't apply for this job. This is what he does. And so God, I pray in this moment that you would bless these gifts bless those who give as we release authority of that which is in our hands and we place it in your hands and we say go Lord let your kingdom come let your will fully manifest on earth as it is in heaven God I understand that there's this kingdom dynamic that comes crashing down in moments like these and that your desire to bless us often is so much greater than our resolve to access it because of things that have been said, things that have been spoken, you know, abuses that have been demonstrated on the earth, but your word is still true. And I will not shape my theology based on negative past experiences. I will shape my theology on who you are. And so I am being bold, even in this room and everyone within the sound of my voice. God, I am declaring, proclaiming jobs in marketplace favor, jobs that we don't even apply for, promotions we're not even looking for. Show the world who your sons and your daughters are, and we will supply the needs of the kingdom around the earth with joy in our hearts because you are so, so good. Jesus name amen and so I'm just going to say if you're if you're uh, if you've got checks at some point we got baskets up here there's a basket in the back you can drop that off you're doing the credit card thing you know what to do but I want to call the ministry team up quickly there's no online ministry today so for those of you who are online we do apologize for that but today's only in house but I'm going to pray for you guys online as well as those who are in-house. But if you're here, you're listening, if you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never had the opportunity, or you had the opportunity, but you know about him, maybe you grew up in church, but you don't know him like this. I'm ta- Look, he wants relationship with you. He wants to be the breakthrough 
for you. And it just starts with a yes. I'm not even going to pray with you today. I'm not going to guide you. I want you to just say yes to him and lean into him. The cross was enough to eradicate the issue of sin from your life. And he will work with you in this process to see you transformed. And this transformation, it just never ends. It's it's from one level of glory to a greater level of glory to a greater level of glory. It never gets boring. It never becomes mundane. He is always working in you to reshape you into a more effective, fiery brand of the Father's heart on the earth in Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to understand it all, I'm telling you. It just starts with yes to Him. Invite His love into your heart and make Him the primary authority in your life and watch what happens. Breakthrough is here today. It feels like this sort of gentle, easy service, this sweet, there's a sweetness in the room, but sometimes that's what breakthrough looks like. I love things that blow up, things that go boom, and things that are loud and boisterous, but sometimes the breakthrough comes in such a way that it just drives you to your knees and causes you to weep. To stand with arms extended, trying to encompass the immensity of the beauty and the glory of King Jesus. If you're here and you need to say yes to Jesus, perhaps in a greater level than you have before, if you're here and you need a breakthrough in your life, any area of your life, whether it be financially, physically, if you need physical healing, We want to pray healing over you. We are aggressive against infirmity. We are aggressive against sickness and disease. Because if we're not, who who else is going to be that? We want to pray for you today. And this is how we're going to close our service. If we weren't Daniel fasting right now, we would have good coffee in the back. Not church coffee, but good coffee. You have to wait a few more weeks for that. We do have tea. <laughs> so nice. I drink tea sometimes. The Holy Spirit, come. I speak your glory in this room, God. In all grace and mercy again, God, I ask. Jesus, that you would step into this room in the fullness of your character because when you do that, something within us just begins to vibrate with your glory. Let there be an encounter today that is felt and an encounter today that is transformational. Jesus, would you extend your sword into this place? Would you divide between the issues of the soul and the spirit right here, right now? The mission is too great. The times are so urgent that the people of God would stand up, that the bride of Christ would emerge in the fullness of her identity, confident in this righteousness that comes by faith alone. And would you bring to us a fresh baptism of your fire, a fresh saturation in your love, so that we have no choice but to turn our eyes upon Jesus and to look full into your wonderful face. And then everything else grows dim in your light, in your light, in your light. And so I speak that salvation, that healing, and that deliverance today.